Welcome to tonight's webinar. My name is Blake Bauckham and I'm the Director of Sales for Osteogenics. Before we get started, let me address how we will be interacting today. From a technical perspective, we can't hear or see you, but we would love to hear from you and answer any questions that you might have. There's a question and answer button on the right hand side of your screen where you can type your questions at any time and we will try to get to them answered during the webinar. Dr. Robert Silver received his dental degree from Uberlandia Federal University in 1994. He was board certified in periodontics by the Brasilia section of the Brazilian Dental Association in 1997 and completed his master's and PhD programs in 2002 and 2004 from Perusicaba Dental School, Campinas University. He was the first recipient of the first edition of the E. Bud Tarson Award granted by the AAP in 2005. And he is one of the winners of the Growth Against Recession Aesthetic Case Competition from the Aesthetic Case Book in 2011. He is also a professor at the Implant Perio Institute for Research and Advanced Dental Training. That's in Sao Paulo. And he is the author and co-author of several scientific publications and chapters and textbooks with emphasis on periodontal tissue management around teeth and implants. Dr. Silva has published two wonderful textbooks that are available in Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, and English. Dr. Silva, thank you for your time. Really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Blake, for the very nice introduction and, uh, and bringing me here to talk to you and maybe help uh, our attendees there globally to understand better and maybe treat uh, some of the cases related to bone augmentation. So it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you, my friend. Looking forward to it. So good to go. Okay, so uh, again, thank you very much for uh, giving me this opportunity and I hope that this topic can find some value for those who are watching. So the topic of my presentation today is pretty much centered around this very important issue, which is the absence of bone to place implants. So I'm going to be talking to you about the limits and the predictability of this uh, technique, which is the uh, three-dimensional ridge augmentation. And we are here today because we know that uh, the bone tissue is essential for us to place our implants in the three-dimensional uh, prosthetically driven position. And the problem is that many often times, if we are working in the office, we're gonna face clinical situations such as those in which uh, it's either impossible to place implants because there is no bone whatsoever, or it's maybe very challenging for us to place the implants in the good position. So whenever we are facing clinical scenarios such as those, and if we want to, uh, to get to a very predictable and good resolution of the case, we must do the bone augmentation. And this is the thing. Very often times we're gonna see situations such as those where we don't have the height or the volume of bone. So what can we do about it? And the clinical objective of the bone augmentation procedure is pretty much changing the anatomy of this clinical scenario in terms of the volume and the height of the bone, creating not only the bone, but a vital and strong bone in a way that later on we can place our implants. And that is exactly what you are seeing right now. So after uh, one or other technique that we can use, uh, we're gonna change the anatomy of the ridge and now having the possibility of placing the implants uh, in a very nice solid bone in the three-dimensional position. And just see this case here where it's an absolute massive bone loss that after we have done the augmentation, this is the kind of bone that we can recreate. So it's a very, very nice solid ridge that now we can place our implants. And very often times we have the possibility to take some bone biopsy 
to check what's going on. And this is what we want to see histologically. Uh, and that is essentially the reformation of a very nice living bone associated with some bone particles that are giving some strength to the bone tissue and a marrow which uh, we had no inflammatory cells in that area and that is uh, clinically relevant when we can see something like that that you can see that the bone is very solid very strong and very easy now for us to place implants if you remember how we have started our clinical procedure so that is pretty much the objective of the bone augmentation procedure but essentially this is not only one two three four seven eight ten millimeters of new bone it is much more than that Creating new bone for our patients is sometimes changing the life of our patients. And just to make a point, please look at these three different, different ladies who uh, have different backgrounds, who have different perspectives, but they share one thing in common. And that is that they don't have the availability of bone to place the implants at those missing teeth. And if we apply the concept of bone reconstruction, we can change the anatomy of that ridge. And by doing so, right now it's possible to place the implants in a very nice solid bone and later on place our implants, later on provided them the prosthesis, and you can see the change in their smile. Completely different because we did the bone augmentation creating the possibility to place the implants accordingly so that is a life-changing procedure not only on the functional aspect but on the static and emotional aspect as well so that is a very very important tool that we should understand and master in our offices in a way that we can help our patients to live better. And that is essentially what we do as dentists to make our patients smile in a very, very nice way. But bone augmentation is not a technique. It's a clinical objective. So the objective of bone augmentation is to create bone. And we know that that can be obtained using different strategies and technologies. So there are a lot of alternatives that we can use, but pretty much I think that widely, uh, these are the, the two most uh, used techniques that people can use around the globe. And that is the autologous uh, intraoral bone uh, graft, in which we take bone from different areas, maybe the chin or the ramus, and we can replace that piece of bone in a different area. And that is very good, but very challenging in the perspective that, you know, uh, it's much more traumatic for the patient. Sometimes it's very difficult to adapt that block. Sometimes the vas revascularization of that block can be very challenging in a way that on the other end we can also perform the guided bone regeneration that essentially means that we are going to place a membrane uh, and a particulated bone on the, the uh, on the area that needs to be reconstructed and we can grow that bone in a different perspective and those two techniques have been repaginated recently so today we can use the bone plates from autologous bone, which is uh, a, a little bit better in terms of uh, the biological aspects, if I can say. And also uh, uh, the meshes that are customized in a way that facilitates the placement of the graft in very uh, demanding areas. But uh, both techniques, 
the bone blocks and the guided bone re regeneration can pretty much get to the same endpoint. However, in my perspective and in my humble opinion, the guided bone regeneration is the most versatile techniques that we can use to treat our patients. I mean, uh, there are some cases that I think that the guide bone regeneration can treat, whereas the bone plates cannot treat the, the, exactly the same way. So guided bone regeneration is much more versatile. So it doesn't matter if I'm treating the maxillar or the mandible, horizontal or vertical def defects, anterior or posterior, bigger or smaller defects. It's always possible to cover the defect with the membrane. So that makes this procedure very versatile. And because we are using a particulated bone and not a block, it favors the uh, revascularization of the bone that is building below the membrane. And that makes the procedure very predictable. But don't get me wrong, it's very predictable, but it's a very tricky uh, procedure in which anything can go wrong. So it's a very sensitive procedure that we must master in the best way possible to uh, diminish the amount of complications that we can see in our offices. So the cases that we're going to see or the case that I'm going to be presenting to you or the technique that I like to use is pretty much the guided bone regeneration in which, again, uh, the defect is going to be covered by one or other membrane. So that means the osteopromotion in which we're going to cover the edges of the defect in a way that we are preventing the cells that we do not want to enter the regenerative site, which are the cells from the epithelium and uh, a connective tissue, and making uh, the area prone to receive the cells that we do want, which are the cells from the periodontal ligament space when it's there, or the bone marrow, in a way that we are promoting the bone to grow in that uh, protected region. We have uh, non-resorbable membranes or we have resorbable membranes and uh, it's pretty much the defect that is going to tell me what is the membrane that I'm going to be used. And in a moment, I'll be telling you my decision tree on that regards. So when when we, when we see uh, or we study this technique, there are so many uh, literature talking about that, but I pretty much like this quote by Professor Tinti, who is one of the godfathers of the guided bone regeneration, that mentioned that if you want to be successful in, the, uh, in using the guided bone regeneration concept, we must be very, very strict and obedient to the surgical technique that goes from the incision to the suture. So and if we make anything wrong from all the way from the beginning to the end, anything can pretty much lead to a complication. So it's very essential a key that we really master this procedure in a way that we are able to do things in the best uh, way possible in a very neat and pristine uh, and very precise way. So here again, you can see a very quick uh, video showing all the steps uh, of this guided bone regeneration. And pretty much again, everything is very, very important from the incision to the suture. And uh, in a one hour lecture, it's kind of impossible to give all the details of that. But I tell you that uh, it's possible to learn the tricks uh, very, very precisely in a way that we are able to perform the procedures in the best way possible. And uh, very key is to kind, kind, kind of uh, determining what are the biomaterials that we are going to use. And as I mentioned to you, it is the defect configuration that will name what kind of membrane that I'm going to be using to cover the nature of that given defect. 
So uh, the anatomy of the defect is pretty much important. And we know that there are basically two kinds of uh, deficiencies that we can treat using the guided bone regeneration concept. So the first one is the vertical uh, uh, defect, which pretty much uh, is characterized by having the bone peaks adjacent to the defect more coronal to the base of the defect in a way that if you uh, connect uh, one bone peak from one side to the other side, it is not a straight line, but it's like a curved line. So we have bone peaks more coronal to the base of the defect. And that is very different from the horizontal defect, which uh, shows here in this picture that the, la the, the line connecting one bone peak from one side to the another is a straight line, not a curved line. So that is uh, the difference between the vertical and the horizontal. But when we talk, we talk about horizontal defects, there is a subclassification here, which must be remembered. And that is the favorable horizontal defect or the unfavorable horizontal defect. And the difference being between those two you know, kinds of defects is that in between the cortical plate from the buccal and the lingual side, in the favorable one, we have the medullary spaces, which have much more cells, vessels, and growth factors as compared to the unfavorable defect or the knife edge deficiency, because here in this situation, you don't see the medullary space in between those two corticals that are merged together. So much more challenging situation in the biological perspective. So it's essential that we understand what kind of defect that we are using. And because of that, now I can choose the membrane that I'm going to be using, but I have to understand the, the predictability of that case. So how much bone can we grow in each defect? In the vertical deficiency, we can grow as much bone as the height of the interproximal bone peaks. So it doesn't matter the magnitude of the defects. What's really important to me is to understand the position of the interproximal bone peaks because that is the line onto which I can grow bone too. So pretty much you have to connect visually one, one bone peak to the other side, and that is the amount of bone that I can grow. So sometimes in the office, we must have very, very challenging discussions with our patients because just an example here, if you see this central sizer here, if you feel that the mesial aspect of the bone peak of that tooth is much more apical to the mesial aspect of that same tooth, that means that we cannot grow as much bone in the vertical direction. So in order to have a higher bone peak, sometimes we have to extract those teeth, which is very difficult for the patient to accept and understand. But you as a clinician have to uh, acknowledge the fact that the magnitude of vertical bone growth is limited in the predictable basis to the height of the interproximal bone peaks. And that is very important. In terms of horizontal growth, it's predictable to have bone at, you know, uh, lined to the buccal and palatal bone peaks adjacent to the defect that you have here. So it's a, it's a matter of connecting the dots. So the buccal, to one tooth to the other side, the palatal from one side to the other side, and the heights of the interpro interproximal bone peaks. If you interconnect those dots, you're gonna see the amount of bone that we can grow in the predictable basis. And of course, now that I understand what kind of defect that I have and how much bone that I can grow, it's very important to choose the biomaterials. And of course, there are some uh, changes that can be applied here and there, but pretty much the rule of thumb here is that when I'm having 
vertical deficiencies, it's much easier to treat those with the titanium reinforced barrier membranes, such as, such as the cytoplast material that is a Teflon or PTFE material that is form stable, which is a very, very easy membrane to place on top of those very challenging defects because it's form stable. But you have to place it there and then you have to retrieve it in a secondary procedure months later, May, namely nine to 12 months after we do the procedure, we have to reopen the site to take it out because it's a non-resorbable material. But when I'm treating the horizontal defects, we can use a much more comfortable membrane in terms of the perspective of decreasing the number of complications. And that is collagen-based biomaterials, like a, like a, uh, a collagen membrane here, which is much more suitable for these horizontal defects. So remember that the most, uh, the, the bigger the defect, the more we are going to the titanium reinforced membranes, non-resorbable non membranes. But when I'm treating smaller cases such as the horizontal defects, I'm much prone to use or choose the collagen biomaterial, okay? So I know the defect, I know the amount of bone that I can grow, and I can I already chose the right membrane for that kind of configuration. But below that membrane, we must apply our biomaterial. And if you really want to be successful and predictable, I suggest you to always use this kind of combination. And that is about 50% of the bone that we need to you know, fill that area below the membrane with autologous bone. And the other half of it, like a, a hydroxapatite, a xenograft, or un, any, any kind of other biomaterial that you want to use, but always in like a one-to-one -one ratio, using autologous bone as part of that. And of course, that if you want to further you know, improve the potential of bringing more cells to the area, you can always use some biologics, and there are different in the market, and in a way that if you apply one of those to your bone graft material, you're going to be adding some growth factors or factors that will attract more cells to the recipient site, and that will facilitate our regenerative procedure. So pretty much that is the decision tree that you have to remember. And having said that, I'd like to show you a, a very, very nice case that, um, that I did with those two colleagues from the left, uh, who are my colleagues from Brazil, from Goiânia, Dr. Erika and Dr. Alexandre, who uh, sent me this clinical uh, picture here and asked me if it could help them to treat this very young lady who have uh, an, an accident, uh, you know, riding her bike and end up losing those three teeth on your left uh, side of the screen. And you can pretty much see that she has some fake gingiva there and she has a very high smile line, very young lady, and maybe you can help her with some kind of treatment. So when she takes out her appliance there, you can see uh, the scenario a little bit closer and you can appreciate that she has lost also the volume of the bone below the lip and that is why she had lost you know the support for her lip when we look a little bit closer in the mouth you can see that um, there is an abscess here on top of that central incisor and of course that means that something is going wrong in that area and when we see the x-ray you can appreciate that we have some lesion here in this area not so much here on the other side which is the premolar it seems to be okay but the cbct pretty much shows that unfortunately the central incisor here is hopeless and it has to be extracted and everything's okay with the premolar on the other side so of course that we have to give that very bad news for the patient and she was very upset about that of course 
but we must be very technical about it and 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 you know do what have to do and and that moment was to extract the tooth so i took it out um clean the area and debride it in the best way possible and i placed it here like um, a collagen sponge just to support and help the healing to take place and after some weeks this is the scenario that we have right now to treat her um, and try to to make something for her in that uh, area of the mouth you can see that uh, we we still have a good depth of the vestibule but we have a lot of scar tissue here right now because of the fracture that she has she, she went through and she has uh, lost the volume of that area and of course that when we, we see the cbct you can pretty much see that we have a very nice and very thin ridge here to work and a important vertical deficiency here associated to that area so what we did here was to open a flap and do our bone augmentation so i elevate a full thickness flap um, i am cl cleaning out the nasal palatal canal and removing all the soft tissues from uh, the bone and cleaning the roots i'm doing the decortication to promote the bleeding of the area here i'm using a tenting screw at the height of the interproximal bone peaks and now i'm changing my gloves to make the procedure the most clean possible and i'm using this foil there to cut precisely the membrane which was in his case here the cytoplast material 30 by 40 that i'm uh, using the profix in the palatal area to stabilize the membrane in the base on the palatal side and here you are seeing me positioning the, gra the graft that is uh, 50 percent of autologous bone 50% of a xenograft mixed with some blood from the patient. And I'm positioning the bone graft first on the palatal aspect, then on the occlusal aspect, then on the buccal aspect, trying to recreate the volume that she has lost due to her, to her accident. So you can see that I'm trying to be as... Uh, it's it's stopped here is everything okay 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 so you can you can see here that i'm positioning the membrane on the buccal aspect right now and the profix again is being uh, used there in a way that i'm really really stabilizing the membrane with the shape that i have recreated it's very important that the membrane is very stable. So some extra screw is being positioned there. And it's also very important that no piece of the membrane is touching the adjacent teeth to prevent some uh, contamination to take place. It's very important as well to release the flap, so which I did using a blade. And I'm covering the edges of that cytoplast material with a collagen membrane just to you know really protect the edges of the membrane from the uh, entrance of some um, uh, soft tissue from the flap and then of course uh, i'm using some um, lprf membranes to help the healing of the tissue and of course the horizontal matrix sutures were used with the cytoplast material as well which is very very nice material to be used and a tension-free passive closure was obtained and here you can see that uh, in the picture that we were we were really we were really effective to free the tissue and you can appreciate this kind of connection of the buckle and the palatal flap in a way that we don't have this kind of butt joint you know suture but you have this connection of the palatal and the buccal tissue like at least four millimeters of connective tissue facing each other in a way that um, it's much more safe to have the healing in that area 
Whenever you have something finishing like that, that means that maybe you didn't do a good job in terms of the release of the flap in a way that now you have more complications, you have more chances to have complications. But when you finish something like that, it's a very, very nice thing to be seen at the end of your surgery. And this is what we are seeing here. After 21 days, when we finished removing all these, the sutures of the patient, you can see that everything is completely closed. There's no opening there. Soft tissue is healing really, really nicely. You can appreciate that we had to remove all the acrylic from the, uh, you know, the fake gingiva there. And that means that a lot of tissue was brought in the coronal direction, if you remember how we started. And of course, now it's a matter of waiting the healing of the patient. So six months down the line, uh, we got an x-ray showing here that, uh, you know, it seems to be connected the lines, you know, one side to the other side, it seems to be have a straight line. And that means that our membrane was stable and the, the tanking screw was stabilizing it in the, that position. Everything is healing well, but of course that six months is too, uh, too early to open the site. So we decided to wait more months. So when we are talking about vertical augmentations using this kind of strategy, we recommend to wait between nine and 12 months to reopen the site. The site. So three more, three more months passed. So now we are nine months down the line. You can see that everything is pretty much closed. No healing problems. But now you can see that we have a very big deviation of the mucogingival line. But you can also see that the, the tissue here is a, it's kind of pregnant. So it's a very, very big, you know, volume of the tissue on that area. That seems to be a very, very nice bone. But we have to see the CBCT of that patient. And this, this is just a comparison here between how we started how it is nine months down the line see that we have completely lost the uh, the vestibule of the patient because of the amount of you know growth that was achieved there the volume here is very very nice observed here on this picture and the cbct shows a very nice volume in the buccal aspect and again a very very nice uh, you know horizontal aspect here connecting one dot to the another dot so it's a straight line right now so we converted a vertical deficiency to a much more horizontal aspect in a very very nice way and the sagittal cuts shows again that it's unbelievable the amount of bone that were that was recreated and those uh 3d images here shows as as well a very nice uh volumetric change if we remember how it was before it was a knife edge situation now we can see this very very nice volumetric change here in this area and of course now we are able to reopen the site so this is the moment that i'm reopening and i can see a very nice uh whitish appearance of the membrane showing that uh, we didn't have any kind of uh, infection, you know, subclinical uh, uh, infection below the, the flap. So it's a moment that we have to take out uh, our membrane. So here I'm reopening the side. So doing like a crestal incision here to the, to the membrane, getting to the membrane. I'm doing a little bit of vertical releasing augmentation, uh, uh, to vertical releasing incisions uh, distally, and I'm reopening the site, completely exposing the edges of the membrane. So this is very important that we are able to really um, elevate the, the flap in a way that the margins of the, uh, of the membrane are exposed. And then we remove the screws, and then we, we detach the membrane from the bone and by doing that we're going to see the quality of the bone that was recreated there 
you can see this very, very nice uh, uh, whitish and, uh, you know, bleeding bone that is there showing the good quality of that bone. And now is the moment to remove the tainting screw. And you can see uh, after I remove it that it's bleeding coming from inside, showing that the bone is pretty much vital and uh, very, very hard because when we hit it with some instrument, you can appreciate the density of that bone, not only by visual aspect, but also with the feeling with our instrument showing that the bone is a very, very solid and very nice. So you remember that I used a foil to cut the membrane. And essentially what I did that, uh, what, what I did at that moment was to print a 3D model that I filled or I waxed with something there. And that is the amount of bone that I wanted, that I really wanted to have to place my implant. And on top of that, I created a foil that of course was taken to the sterilization process. And then at the moment of the surgery, I used that stereo foil to cut my membrane. But this is the amount of bone that I was able to recreate. So a much bigger bone than I really expected. If you think about the bone prominences from the buccal and the palatal side. So it's very nice to see this beautiful bone here. But we know that, you know, the bone that is outside the bone envelope has some tendency to resorb through time. But I really rely on the amount of bone that is pre-existing in the envelope in that area. So you can see that a lot of bone was recreated here. And now we have to place our implants. So there is some kind of uh, discussion here on the amount of implants that we can place in this area. Most of my colleagues would suggest me to place three implants in this, in this, uh, in the, in this area, but uh, we saw clinically and you know, digitally, that the space, uh, you know, in this area, in the horizontal aspect, and also taking the consideration the curve of the maxilla and the volume of the bone that we had and the desires of the patient we took into consideration, we considered that it was possible to place four implants for her. So this is exactly what we did. So we planned the case in a way that... Uh, uh, four implants were positioned there, so using a guide, uh, a guided uh, procedure. So four uh, Nobel replace implants were positioned there. So of course that we used narrow diameter implants, platform switching. So those were uh, um, uh, Nobel replace uh, conical connection, 3.5 millimeters diameter implants. And you can see that I'm drilling through the bone. It seems to be very, very hard. You can see that when I'm drilling through the bone, the head of the patient is moving a little bit up because I'm putting pressure to drill through that bone. And that gives the sense that the bone is very, very hard. And then through the, uh, the surgical guide, again, I'm placing four implants, again, four uh, narrow diameter implants, platform switched implants uh, um, that will be very, very well positioned in the bone. And you can appreciate here that the implants are very, very precisely positioned through the surgical guide. And here, of course, I'm positioned here, three, uh, three millimeters high healing caps in a way that after doing that, in this kind of procedures, we can always grow a little bit of more bone so essentially here, I'm doing like a, a layering of new bone on top of the regenerated bone just for the sake of protecting the new regenerated bone. And by using those three millimeters high healing caps, using the xenograft again as a grafting material, I'm trying to improve the height 
of the bone between the implants, trying to mimic a papilla later on to have a better uh, uh, possibility of statics in this case. I'm using also enamel matrix proteins on the adjacent teeth, trying to help the periodontal attachment in that area. And the collagen membrane was positioned first on the palatal side, then on the buccal, and then some tacks were used to do the sausage technique on top of the vertically regenerated, regenerated tissue. And of course, the difficult part again is to close the area because of the volume that was gained and a new regeneration procedure was performed. So here it's a very, very tricky and clinically demanding procedure to pretty much close this area. But we did in a very passive way, as you can see there. And this is the initial healing of the patient and the x-ray showing a very good parallelism of oh, those four implants. We have to wait, of course, so we waited about uh, four to five months before we reopened that area. Uh, and here you can see, you know, the implants that were positioned there and uh, uh, some kind of smile design to position the cervical regions of those teeth. And of course, now we did the reopening. So after, as I mentioned to you, like four months, four to five months, we re reopened the site. So we changed from three millimeters high healing caps to like five or six millimeter high healing caps. And we removed here a free gingival graft from the palatal tissue, from the palatal area and we have deeptalized it outside the mouth and we covered the, the you know those uh, high healing caps like a mexican you know poncho on top of that in a way that we are improving the thickness of the soft tissues not only in the buccal on the palatal but also in between the implants and then we closed everything in the best way possible and on the right, you can see the heating of that pretty much showing a very, very nice volume of that area that was recreated there. So after some time, uh, and this is where I didn't agree very much with my colleagues from, you know, the other place, Dr. Erika and Alexandre, that they decided to uh, deliver the pro provisional prosthesis to that patient before the final stage of the surgical aspect was created. Because here you can see that now we have good bone, we have good, you know, implants, well positioned. We have a very nice volume of soft tissue as well, but we don't have the keratinized tissue. So I would suggest that we always do the final soft tissue stage before we go for the prosthesis. But because of the patient that she was very tired already, so they decided to deliver the, uh, the provisional restoration there. So uh, a scanning of, of it was performed here and the provisional uh, and the provisional restoration was planned in the lab. You can see uh, how well positioned were those implants according to the digital planning of the patient. And this is how the provisional restoration was delivered to the patient. You can see that the lateral area, which is everybody tells me that they are afraid of the lateral because of the pontic you know, situation, but you can see that the pontic, the, the area here in the, in, in the lateral area is pretty much nice, but we have a little bit of loss here in, the, in between the centrals. And this moment, of course, I told my colleagues that listen, now there's nothing can do right now. We have to wait some time until the soft tissue heals before we go for the soft tissue final stage, which is the free gingival graft and the, uh, uh, the deepening of the vestibule, again, the vestibule, vestibule plasty that has to be done here in this area. But this is how she started. This is how she is right now in this moment. And after some uh, months of waiting, 
this is how we end up doing here the, the vestibuloplasty and the recreation of the um, keratinized tissue. So uh, we did the vestibuloplasty, repositioned the fornix in the apical area, created this kind of bleeding area here. And of course, we placed here a free gingival graft in the apical area, the so-called strip gingival graft. And we used the connective tissue graft, you know, uh, in the buccal area, trying to reduce the color change in this area. Uh, this is the initial heating of that area. You can pretty much see that it's, he is taking, the connective tissue is taking a very, very positive way. And of course that we have to wait. And after some weeks of healing, you can see that the palatal area is healing perfectly. And the recipient site is also uh, increasing uh, a lot in the quality. You can see that even the papilla here is improving again, is coming back after some time. And this is how the patient looks right now. So you can see from how we started, how we are at this moment. The final prosthesis was not delivered so far, but you can pretty much see that, you know, now we have the, the vestibule back again. We have a very, very big amount of keratinized tissue here. We have a very nice, you know, gingival architecture. We, although it's not perfect, but if you remember how we started, and the amount of bone that we had, I think that this is a very nice resolution. There is some, uh, some you know, fibrotic tissue here in the apical area, but it's pretty much below the line of the lip of the patient, so it's not, not a concern for her. Um, and of course that um, I, we still have to do the final prosthesis in this case, but I would say that we have had here a very positive journey in terms of the resolution of this case. Uh, of course, that this is just one case, but we, we have had, you know, done many, many cases throughout our career. And regardless if it's a horizontal or vertical defect in the buckle, uh, I mean, in the uh, uh, anterior or posterior area, upper or lower, we always are able to reconstruct the amount of bone that we need using the principles of the guided bone regeneration, taking into consideration some of the aspects that I just mentioned to you. And of course that we have to see what happens through time. And coming to the end of this presentation, I just like to show you like this 10 years follow-up of, of, of augmentation where we started with a very, very challenging situation here from the left side, and we could end up with a very nice and stable situation 10 years later. And this is my very first clinical case starting from 2005 and the very first vertical augmentation that I started like this, that I did the vertical augmentation using all the strategies that I've told you right now and uh, was able to acquire a very, very nice bone. And 70 years down the line, the patient is still very stable and I could take her from this very, very dramatic situation to a very positive condition. And this kind of outcome here is in line with the literature supporting that if you do the guided bone regeneration using the right uh, and correct principles, you are able to uh, sustain a very nice, stable bone through the time. So, Take home message following this very quick presentation. This is a very predictable but sensitive procedure that would need several procedures to have it finished. So meaning that we have to take in consideration the morbidity, treatment, treatment time and cost of this procedure. This is not for every patient, not for every dentist. So we have to learn how to go through the learning curve and it comes with experience and time. And this, of course, a good alternative for dent dental gingival prestigious understanding the limitations of this technique. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much
for your kind attention. Of course, that I, I still have some time to answer some questions, but those are the informations from our group. So Implant Perio Group, so my email, uh, and some of our um, uh, you know, information there. So thank you very much. And if there are some questions, I'm really happy to answer to them. Wow, Dr. De Silva, thank you so much for that presentation. The, the case that you showed was amazing and what a blessing for that patient. Uh, I know that our viewers are really gonna appreciate the chance to learn from you. So thank you again so much for showing everything there. Um, now we have a little bit of portion for the question and answer. Uh, so just a reminder, if, if you have a question, please uh, use the question and answer button there at the top of your right, or the right hand top of your screen. That'll allow us to get the questions to Dr. Silva here so he can answer them. But uh, we do have a couple of questions here, Dr. Silva. So let me answer them for you or ask them for you. Um, from a flap advancement perspective, how do you ensure that you have enough tissue release to achieve your tension-free passive closure? Uh, that is the most challenging situations for sure when you're talking about vertical ridge augmentation. So you must learn the tricks to, you know, really be able to release the flap. And the very first thing is to know where to place your incision. So when I'm treating the, the upper jaw, I always place the incision towards the buckle, not on the occlusal, not on the palatal, in a way that if I deviate the incision towards the buckle, okay, when I elevate the flap, you know, to the palatal sides, the height of the palatal tissue will be always more coronal uh, than the line connecting the one bone, one bone, the bone peak from one side to the other side. So I have more coronal tissue to, you know, to, to suture that. On the buckle side, we always have to release the flap in a very, very nice way. And to know that I was able to release the flap I must see the flap going, uh, passing the line of the incisal edges of the adjacent teeth. So if I can move the flap more coronal than the sizal edges of the adjacent teeth, I know that I have done a good job in terms of the mobilization of the flap. And then I can do like this because the palatal tissue is more coronal to the defect. And then I can do like this, okay? Okay, so you're just ensuring that you have a true aversion of the flap to have that dual layer yes. closure and the horizontal mattress sutures with single interrupted over the top. If you uh, finish like this, this is problem. You have to finish like that. So in order to avert the flap, as you mentioned, you must do the incision towards the buckle and release the flap very much in the, in the buckle area to have this. Yeah, one of the things that we see or, or you know, one of the, the major causes for complication is this whole thing, which is why it's a great discussion. But um, whenever we talk about the passivization of that flap, even when you're in this situation, that flap has got to be really passive. So here we know that, you know, there's tension there. But even here, the tissues have to be passive in order to have a great healing. So great information yes. there. Um, the other question or another question that came in is on that case that you showed, where did you harvest the autologous bone? Oh, in that case, uh, it was from the Raymonds, okay? Okay. So 90% uh, of the cases that I treat, I take the bone from the Raymonds, which is very, very easy to access and to use a scraper, such as the Safe Scraper, which is a very good tool to harvest bone in a very, very easy way. Uh, I don't like to take blocks to, to, to mill them. I just prefer to to scrape. It takes a little bit more time, of course, but much less traumatic for the patient. I'm using the bone from the chin when I'm treating this area here. So on the lower anterior, I take from, from the chin. And eventually, when I'm doing like smaller cases in, in the maxilla, I use the micros to harvest bone from the, you know, um, uh, the canine pillars here and the anterior spine here. So uh, basically, this is my decision tree. So most of the case, I take bone from the Remo shelf. Great. Uh, there's several more good questions coming in here. So another one is, uh, do you have any experience using corticocancellus allograft material for these types no. of cases? Okay. Zero experience because in Brazil, it's not allowed it here in Brazil. So you, you use xenograft. But I have a lot of friends 
in the U.S., they, they, they use the, uh, you know, this kind of material holographs with the same kind of success. So uh, I, I, what I really think it's important here is to use the autologous bone as part of it. So we use 50% of autologous and 50% of a good biomaterial. You can use xenograph, you can use allograph with a good source. Don't try to use any biomaterial because it's more cheaper than others. It has to be a good, you know, uh, a background. Perfect. Okay, so there's a few more questions here. Uh, first, they want to thank you again for sharing your knowledge. They really appreciate it. But the question is, what do you suggest about regenerating in immunosuppressed patients? Is it indicated? If it is, what are the conditions you suggest uh, that you need to take into account? Oh, no, I, I think that uh, a patient with this kind of condition is not a good candidate for having any kind of, you know, surgical procedure unless it's like an emergency that has to be treated. So I always try to be on the safe side. So uh, I don't like to take smokers to do this kind of big procedures. So smoking is a very, very problem, problematic consideration in terms of the vascularization of the, of the area. I, I'm very concerned about patients that use the thinning blood you know, drugs because of the bleeding aspect, bisphosphonates, uh, you know, very, very problematic patients to, to treat. I don't take them. And if the patient, diabetic patients that are not, you know, um, you know, um, uh, how do you say that? They are in good, uh, balanced, uh, I, I will not consider as well. So pretty much if the patient have any kind of, uh, you know, condition that is not, is deviated them from a good healing aspect, I would say that is not a good candidate for this kind of procedure. So I would not treat those kind of patients. So that would be my uh, consideration on that. Great. We got, uh, well, I think we have about time for one more question. There's still some coming in. So I apologize that we're not going to get to all of the questions here. But um, one last question that I think you can answer fairly quickly. Is there a need to cover the titanium reinforced PTFE with an additional collagen membrane? Uh, no, you, 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 biologically is not necessary, but I like to do that to cover the edges of the membrane because if I don't cover the edges, there's some fibroblastic fibroblast that can migrate in and can create some, you know, periosteum like thicker tissue there. So I like to protect it. Many people do that. And I like to do that as well. Perfect. Well, we're right here at the end of our time. So again, thanks, Dr. Car uh, Dr. Silva, for your, your presentation here, for your time. I know there were some problems with different things going on beforehand, so I appreciate your patience in dealing with us. But um, I, I want to let everybody know that truly after this uh, presentation is over, we will send out a survey uh, for you to fill out. There will also be a pro promotional offer that will come from Osteogenics in an email form. So if there's anything we can help you with, let me know. But uh, beyond that, Dr. Carvalho da Silva, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. It's been very informative, and I know that this will help many people as they treat their patients. Thank you again for your time. Okay, and uh, I know there are some questions that were not answered, so you have my email email there, okay? Or you can send Blake the you know the questions, and that we will be more than happy to answer all of those questions. So with that said, I thank you very much for your attention here. Perfect. Yes, we'll make sure we get the questions to you. So thank you, everybody, and good night. Good night. <laughs> good night.